Hi, everybody. I'm Leslie Carruthers, CEO of Saver Partnership, sitting here with these lovely women and men in the Jaipur Living Showroom at High Point Market, and we're ready to bring you an exciting conversation on the future of design from virtual show houses to the metaverse. I am so excited to be joined by these wonderful, lovely women and men next to me. <laughs> Let me introduce them to you. Ariane Belazaire of Ariane Belazaire Interiors from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Robin Barron from New York City, New York. Laura Muller from Four Point Design Build in Los Angeles, California. And Gary Pettit, the owner of Seasonal Living from Austin, Texas. Hi, everybody. Hi. And we are so happy to have you here with us because today we are talking about the future of design from virtual show houses to the metaverse and what that means for the future of design and what that means for your businesses. Whether you're a manufacturer watching this, whether you're a designer watching this, or whether you're a retailer watching this, you are gonna learn something today. So we're so happy to have you here. Thank you for your time. So we want to start off by talking about the world of virtual show houses. As some of you know that are watching, Seasonal Living, Gary Pettit, the owner of the Seasonal Living Virtual Show House, was the first show house in the world to use augmented reality. And it lives now in the pages of Seasonal Living Magazine. And the three women around me were all participants <laughs> in this particular virtual show house. So, and Robin was also um, a sponsor of it as well. So. We just want to talk about what their experience was like. I want to ask them each, and they're going to talk to you now about what they learned, what they were challenged by, what they want you to know if you're ever invited to participate in one, what Robin learned as a sponsor. And then later on in the conversation, we're going to talk about what's coming next in the future in terms of the metaverse and how that's going to impact your business and what the financial opportunities are going to be for our industry. So, ladies, are we ready to take it away yeah. and jump in? And gents, <laughs> yes, definitely. All right, so I'm going to start here with Ariane. Ariane, you participated as a designer in Season Living Magazine's virtual yes. show house, and you are also now participating in Architectural Digest, the iconic home yes. virtual designer show house in partnership with the Black Interior Designers Network. Yes. So, what has been your experience with both of these and how it is different? What were the challenges? Well, I will absolutely tell you that the amazing opportunity that I had with your show house prepared me to walk into the architectural show <laughs> house. I was one of the designers who was like, Psh, I got this. I know. And the other designers were like, how do we do virtual? What does that mean? Right. So it definitely prepared me for, you know, what to expect with the process, how it differs from the reality of, of how we approach our design projects. And it also, um, I think it's just one of those iconic moments in my in my career that I'll, I will always look at the uh, second show house I've, I've participated with. But the first show house, um, the seasonal living show house, I didn't really understand <laughs> fully who did, who did. when I agreed to do it, <laughs> what it meant or how it worked. I also feel like I wish in the development of that show house and in the way that I talked about the show house after I talked more about the augmented reality because I think that's one of those things that was kind of missed as to what made it so special. Um, but in the process, I, I really just wanted to first and foremost have my space rise to the occasion of what I knew everybody else on that, on that panel was going to do because they're all so talented. So just really bringing my approach to design, my aesthetic to the room that I was given, um, crafting a space that met the challenges of the character. Um, that was developed in the brief that we were given and then just really hoping that it was something that would inspire people who visited it to think bigger when they think about designing or decorating their own home. So what did you find was the biggest challenge really as you were doing it? I think the biggest challenge, and I think we're all going to agree with this, <laughs> was trust. Um, yeah. You know, letting as designers, le letting it go, let yeah. it go, yeah. you know, frozen, <laughs> like let it go. Um, as designers, we are used to having our hands on a project and tweaking it to the last minute. Literally, like, install day looks like this. All right? <laughs> it's like we are down to the wire to the minute. Yeah. And with this project, we had a very tight deadline. We had deliverables we had to give to the graphic design team. And then we had to just sit on our hands and say, I, I hope they got it. I really <laughs> right, right. hope they got the intention. Um, and then just kind of breathe after we saw what they were able to put together with, with our, you know, our notes and, and you know, renderings and inspiration and everything that we gave them to kind of try to communicate what we wanted to have happen in that space. So Which 
which I want to say they did a remarkable they job of really doing did. it. Because they really as did. Because as new as it was for us, it was also new for them. Absolutely. It was the first time yeah. anybody did it. Yeah. Whether Absolutely. it's Gary, whether it's us as designers, right. whether it's them as the renderers, it really uh, took a big leap of faith for everyone. For everyone. That's right. And I think they did a spectacular job. And I, I, and I think it, I, to me, it was an amazing achievement that you had you know, all these different manufacturers who typically work independently mm -hmm. of one another. Mm -hmm. Then you had the designers who are much more of a collaborative bunch who understood the opportunity, but all of them coming to seasonal living and participating in this and working very closely with Leslie and I. And what was really interesting from my perspective is the level of trust. And so as the host of the house or the owner of the show house, that was something, it was a big gulp. Yeah. It was like, oh my goodness, this is really going to come. It was such a risk. Did you because, sleep during that entire well, time? Actually, no. Leslie and I, we never knew how much it took to launch the show house. Mm -hmm. We still talk about how the hours were just yeah. evaporated. Right. And it was a massive project, but it was... It was amazing the commitment everybody made. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things that, that uh, if I can chime in as a, the des a designer in the house, mm -hmm. is that, you know, it's a virtual house, and I don't want designers that are out there and thinking of doing virtual homes think that it's, it's an easy way to do it, you know, because it's not, it, you're not really um, physically yeah. creating the rooms. You don't have to have the drapes made. You don't have to have the furniture delivered. But you have to spend as much time as you do designing a real uh, in-person show house with a digital. If you want it to be good, you have to spend as much time and as, do as much detail as you do in, in, in a regular show house. Yeah. I, would I, more, I would say more. Because, say that because well. what we know in the spaces that we kind of own that are in the physical realm mm -hmm. <laughs> is that we know we're gonna have to the minute to tweak. Right. So we know we just kind of have to have the full vision and set forth the intention and have our team and our trades and everyone who's actually putting it together understand where we're going but we also know we're going to be each step tweaking and adjusting and using yeah. as we go right this is different. with this you have to have such clarity so early right. and then you have to put that down on paper so that the other person who's responsible for making it a reality has the same picture in their head that you do and you have to in your selections yeah. you have to know that it's going to look good digitally That's right. it's not just in person because you the, the subtleties of fabrics that, that you might use in person is That's very right. different than what you would want to do digitally. So it took a lot of effort, a lot of time and effort, much more than I, than I thought initially. Mm -hmm. Initially I said, sure, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, time. it's during COVID. I have nothing else to do. It would be great. But it, 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 it took quite a lot. And, it, and I think it really paid off. It's a spectacular, spectacular yeah. show. Happened. And you know, one of the things I thought was amazing about it from a manufacturer's perspective was that is such a rare opportunity for a company like Seasonal Living or any of the other manufacturers to have to work so closely with designers. I mean, oh, yeah. Laura and I, we worked tirelessly on the exterior of the house and there was so much collaboration that we got to understand each other. In the real world, I would never have that opportunity to work so closely with Laura. And I think it's important to tell everybody what came out of working together so closely yes. is a whole licensed collection for Laura yeah. <laughs> with Seasonal Living. <laughs> well, thanks, Robin. Well, I, I do agree. I mean, I think as designers that have that have uh, been around a little bit and have ex had our share of experiences, I think one of the things we all share was the, the, the unknown. Yeah. And definitely letting go. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that that was the one thing that I think all independently when somebody asked us all, you know, what was the biggest challenge? It was that yeah. minutia that we tweak at the end. I mean, I don't think about, you know, I approach every project like a builder and right. a designer and, you know, I, I'm very linear. So I had to make sure that, um, you know, it was buildable. It was actually accurate. It was something that wasn't just, you know, a fantasy, but that could I create a fantasy in reality? Right. And you know, that's kind of where I can't help but stay. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing that, and to, to possibly think of staging yes. when I'm drawing mm -hmm. art, you right. know, the, the construction drawings, it's like, what? That's I don't think of that until the photo shoot, that's you know? Right. Right. And I think that 
it, it kind of flattened everything. You take all those proscenium layers and you kind of flatten them all and they're all due at once. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was, and it was time consuming. Yeah, very time consuming. Very time consuming to send an accurate message to the, gr the graphic team yeah. because they only have what you tell them to go on there and we have that and they don't know us and they don't know they're us. not they working with us in person they don't right. know our personalities and they had never done it before That's right. right so they it was a big overwhelming right. everybody closed their eyes held hands and jumped <laughs> off the cliff at the same time and it That's was true. as exciting and as terrifying yes but we were skydiving during it's covid yeah. <laughs> exactly but that's what it felt like I you know getting getting the first drafts of <laughs> of the renderings mm -hmm. and holding my breath like really like because also this this 4d 3d um technology was also very new to me mm -hmm. i had never worked in that kind of you know really photorealistic 3d before mm -hmm. and so i didn't really know what to expect how good it would be it's interesting because i have a different perspective say to designer designers look at these rooms in totality they look at the colors, the textures, the tones, the light. Manufacturers are looking at their products. Mm, right. And some of our manufacturers, quite rightly, Neiman Weeks, for example, he's gorgeous. Justin has the most beautiful line. And he was very particular about his line. <laughs> Global Views and David and his team, I really wanted to make sure that they were thrilled with their products. So while the tweaking was going on with the designers, there was another pressure level, yes. which was manufacturers talking about their products. And as any manufacturer knows who's rendered product, mm -hmm. it's, it's a render. It's, it's literally, it's a drawing. And so in the real world, it's not the true thing. Right. And so there's going yeah. to be some computer or artist impression of that. And what a manufacturer zones in, a designer completely misses. Mm -hmm because it's not their ownership. Right. We're so. looking at the holistic picture. Absolutely. Right. Which is what we have to do. That's right. and, and we notice every detail, but not about every product. Right. And on that note too, we have to work with the products that they want highlighted because without the manufacturers and without the product, we have no showcase. That's right. we, we, we don't exist. That's right. So working with your vision versus working with the vision of the, the products, and what they want highlighted, you have to stay extremely flexible and, and make sure that it's talk about collaboration because your vision may require a little tweaking right. and right. a little, maybe right. a little compromise. Right. And I think that that's a natural part of showcase. It is. Well, I, I also think that because the technology is so new and it's even newer that we're implementing it in our world of design, I think that, you know, for me as both a sponsor, manufacturer, and designer, I really had to let go of a lot because <laughs> I can't, I couldn't be too specific about the product or too specific about the overall design. I tried to be, I did, mm -hmm. and they were lovely to work with and, 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 you know, sort of try to, you know, get the end result I wanted. But, you know, we're dealing in a whole new world. We're talking about the metaverse. We're talking about, you know, what the future of design is. Well. We work going into territory that, that we don't really know that well. Or control. Or control. <laughs> and therefore, we have to really learn. It is a life lesson to, to let go. Yeah. It's, it's Absolutely. Letting go. Letting go. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the <laughs> lesson. <laughs> well, and I think that's also the interesting thing about virtual show houses is, on one hand, there is the opportunity to be collaborative with the sponsors, you know, reaching out to them and saying, what's important to you to highlight? What makes your product line important? What are the features that are important? How can I make that a part of the story of the design of the space? So there's the opportunity to collaborate on that. But in most cases, show houses are absent the things that we actually are used to collaborating with in real life. So we usually have a client and we're like having lots of meetings, like, tell me what you like. How many shirts are we storing? What do you, are you right-handed or left-handed? How do you want to cook? It, it's right? a help. It's, it helps the framework. It helps to frame, framework. right? And so while it sounds amazing to have no boundaries, physical boundaries, it is terrifying. <laughs> it's kind of like your kids need right. rules, right? Kids don't like rules. They would prefer to not have rules, but rules and routines help kids thrive. And so as designers, when you're told there's no budget and there's no, you know, like just do whatever you can. It's that with 
a, to a tight timeline makes it really challenging for you to feel like you've put your best forward. So what I would say is that op absence of collaboration with an actual person, um, the, not any of the normal boundaries that we have, and also not collaborating with each other. Like we had no idea what our spaces looked like. If they connected, we didn't know if we were gonna continue. Th I mean, it, the, the fact that it was seamless, is amazing. That was that, kind of a really that was a luck. Huge <laughs> miracle. Huge miracle. I cannot believe that. Because that house we had so perfectly we, from one room to the other. In in a real show house, maybe not so much because it's all about editorial, right? Yeah. But in a true person's house, you're thinking about sight lines and flow and how one story weaves itself into the other, so that everything looks like it's just effortlessly working together. And in this house, you're like, is that even? something that we are worried about. Robin, I hope your room is great, but I'm worried about my room. So, so you know, just, just if you're thinking about doing it, there are great opportunities to collaborate with brands and to really just think differently about the way that you design. But then there's also going to be some things that sound great, but they're also going to make it more challenging for you to execute because you're not going to have the real person with the real things and the real budget that you're used to working and, and maneuvering and navigating around. And, and, you know, I think one of the things that I feel with the two show houses that I've done is I feel like I was strong in my delivery, but I'm like, oh, if I had had a month or two months, what could I have done? Oh, but we you, always feel that way, especially with a show house. That's true, but oh, like, to your point of having to flatten that whole yeah. process, mm -hmm. for me, I'm thinking, did I really deliver my best? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking, did I leave something on the t on the table, right? And I think it's just because we have to flatten that process that is so um, just almost like a roller coaster in a real life yeah. design. And so, you know, you're gonna have the, those feelings if you, yeah. if you do it. And I wanna say for all of you that are, thank you, that was so informative. I'm sure all of you watching were like, yay, yes, it was fantastic, <laughs> all of you. For all of you watching though, that really <clears throat> have never heard of what we're talking about, I wanna reframe a little bit right this second. Um, Season Living Magazine's virtual show house was a collaboration between 11 interior designers, three of whom are at the table with me right now, and also 15 sponsoring brands. Jaipur Living it was one of them. Thank you so much for uh, being a partner with Gary and I. I was a co-principal with Gary uh, on the show house. So Gary is the owner of the show house and it lives forever in the pages of Seasonal Living Magazine. So right now, if you go to seasonalliving.com and look at the link, seasonal, the magazine link, you can actually go and tour the show house. So one of the benefits of doing a virtual show house for any of you watching, whether you're a manufacturer or a designer, is that it, in our case, not only did we do a virtual show house, but we put it inside the pages of a magazine and, that mag and you can go and click on the link inside the magazine and tour it. And not only is it tourable, but parts of it are shoppable. Mm -hmm. If the design, and I want to say for all of you designers watching, the designers had to give their permission for the products in their rooms to be shoppable. Mm -hmm. And the, some of them did, some of them didn't, which was fine with us. And the other thing is there's 50 products in the house that can be viewed via augmented reality. So in the magazine itself, on the page before the show house, you're going to see how to look at the products in augmented reality, which means that you can take your iPhone or your Android and you can actually, through your AR app, you can actually put it on that picture and that item will appear in your own home, anywhere you put it in your home. Mm -hmm. So this is a first in the world digital experience. And, uh, and I'd, I'd jump in and say, I, I, I would jump in and say it's actually the world's first truly global designer show house. Yeah. Because when we looked at the statistics behind it, by my last count, we had up to 120 countries who had experienced the show house. So you think about that in terms of the brand exposure to the sponsoring brands and the designers. 120 countries. 120 you countries, <laughs> you know. That's the data that you get on the back end of doing something virtually. By the it way. is. And, and, and we still today still have people experiencing the show house. And as Leslie says, it lives on forever. So it's a wonderful timestamp of a historic event. Yes. And it's so exciting to have been part of it and to have these three uh, with me as well. You can also go on to Seasonal Living's website and you can read about the show house on their blog as well. So if you just want to see the rest of designers, the rest of the participating <laughs> brands, 
who we were so grateful for being, uh, you know, for taking the risk. It was like Gary said earlier, everyone, you know, sort of diving off, you know, mm -hmm. skydiving, yeah. um, because it was the first that ever had been done. Yeah. And it happened during the year of COVID. So the entire thing was put together by Zoom. It was a major collaboration um, with everyone. So, and I, I would just jump yeah. in and say that, you know, of one, one group of people we haven't talked about who were the true pioneers yes. here yes. was e-design tribe, yes. Jenna Gadaisek and Sarah Dernes. Yes. I mean, they worked incredibly to pull this off. Yeah. I don't think when we first, Leslie and I first started talking to them, they had any idea of the scale um, you know, sure. we had 10,000 10, 10, products yeah. in that house, yeah. over 10,000 products. Yeah. And all you three modeled. All three modeled. Yeah. And what Jenna and Sarah achieved was breathtaking in yeah. terms of that amount of time to turn it around and then deal with designers and manufacturers who were like, <laughs> tweak, hey, tweak, tweak. tweak. Oh, you know how specific we can all be. Yeah. So, but yes. but that, my hat's off to them yes, because sure. awesome job. Well, I, I also want to say, I want to give them a shout out also because it wasn't just that they did the show house. For me as a designer and as a manufacturer, I find that their software is fantastic and easy to use and easy to integrate into, into my business. And I think that that is part of the future of design, not just e-design, but the 3D modeling, the being able to do everything that you can do with um, eDesign Tribe. You can hire, we've been able to hire out mm -hmm. 3D renderers mm -hmm. and, and do work for us. But yeah. this is quick, easy, and inexpensive to do it integrated into your business from your office with your staff. Yeah. And I just want to give them that shout out because that is part of what changed the future for yeah. me. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think even from a manufacturing standpoint, it taught me the importance. I mean, we spend years of doing photography mm -hmm. and the reality is now we're so focused on providing SketchUp models for all of our yeah. products because what we realize out of it is the time it saves designers. Yes. And our goal is to try and support yes. as many designers as we can and time is money. Yep. And we render in, in my firm. So rendering is a part of the visualization process for us with the clients. Again, the goal is the picture in my head, I want you to have the same picture in your head. And I want you to say yes right. so and be that's happy a with big it. Asset so to you. so huge. models are huge for me because if you don't provide it, I have to build it or outsource it or that product might not be spec. If there's another brand yeah. that's giving me a full suite of, you know, full catalog of models, that might be my go-to to kind of look at right. because I know it's a part of my process. So what I want manufacturers to hear is that where we had a dedicated team burning in Malcolm Gladwell's words, 10,000 hours building <laughs> models, that shouldn't be. Like if, you, if it can be a part of your process, especially if you're developing prototypes or developing products, you're already rendering and, and modeling. And in that mm -hmm. process, you can then think about just simply transferring that over um, and making it a model that's usable for any of the designers um, who want to incorporate that product into their projects. And, and Ariane, it's worth saying that, you know, why SketchUp models? Well, SketchUp mm -hmm. models, because from what I answered from Jenna was, it was the most transferable yes. type of yes. model yes. across all platforms. You it's can import universal. it, you can change the, exactly. the format of it. I mean, it's, it, it really is. And SketchUp is one of the programs that more likely than not you'll find design teams using if they're not using something like AutoCAD or Revit or any of those others. So it's a great baseline. If you start with SketchUp, you're probably not gonna have a whole lot of hiccup. If you start with another type of model as your, your go-to, you might find that it takes another step for the designer or design team to, to translate and import it. And also it. for the manufacturer, that's a big investment. Yeah. You know, they've got to have everything drawn. That's right. And so if you've got a large line, yeah. that's, that's an investment. That's right. But it's a difference between a sale or no sale. Sure. Right. And you know, for me, I think it was important to learn to embrace this yeah. technology mm -hmm. because I'm a hand drafter. Mm -hmm. I'm a, you know, yeah. I do hand illustrations, everything's watercolored, yeah. and I, I take the, I this that. emotional I remember thing those days. Those <laughs> days, and, <laughs> and it was cost prohibitive at one yeah. point yeah. to really get a, an architecturally accurate you know, rendering yeah. that you could present that wouldn't oversell yes. and create uh, some sort of a gap in disappointment when it was not well, distorted and it was actually in their home. So yeah. there was a lot of learning in our, the industry itself, which has now doing this 
showcase, what I realized was I kind of um, was a little turned off to yeah. it because I do it in my office, I have a routine, I know what I'm doing, mm -hmm. I, I, I do it a certain way, and if I need SketchUp, I've got SketchUp in the firm as well. But this, the idea that I was going to do this photorealistic rendering mm -hmm. at one point was, was truly cost prohibitive and yeah. time consuming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now with it, I feel like I've waited long enough, all the glitches are now out. <laughs> so right. as a designer coming to the table with some old habits, yeah. some habits that work for me that right. I love, right. Right. and using rendering now that I've learned through the, the showcase house, learning it to augment my business actually make me more efficient and more productive and I can customize what I want to say in the rendering is an amazing um, growth for the industry itself and I think that that's the one thing I really learned because to be quite honest I was like oh you know renderings uh, you know I we'll think when, oh I'm sorry no no go ahead I was just gonna say I think <clears throat> that there's something so beautiful about your creative process for me, rendering isn't because I want to show the client the exact picture of what they're going to get. It's that it's what I use as a creative outlet to, to just it's work through. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah, like, yeah. I'm trying things and I'm doing different iterations. And it's just my, the, the same way that you sketch and draft yeah. and in watercolor, I wish I could do that. I learned basic drafting, like how to yeah. build, but I can't draw like that, right? It would take me too much. But with SketchUp, it's what I use as a creative outlet yeah. to just put forth the vision. And I think that's the same thing for you, and that's why your rendering will always have a place, your hand drawings will always have a place in your process. The same way that I want people to position renderings. It's not the, this is what you're gonna get. It's, in, in some cases, in my case, it's this is the vision, this is the intention. Exactly. Well, but this, is, this, exactly. but this is this is part of the issue with yeah. the 3D renderings. Yeah. Because when you get them photorealistic, mm -hmm. that is what the client is mm -hmm. going to expect. That fabric, mm -hmm. that, that proportion sofa. You have to be very careful because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not as, it doesn't flow the way a hand rendering does. So you really have mm -hmm. to, you know, you know manage your client's expectations. I, I absolutely think it's all and about the way you communicate it. And, and scale. scale. And scale. You know, just through my own experience, I, I recently redid a house and uh, they gave me renderings. Mm -hmm. And even though I understand the process, I remember going back to those renderings and thinking, this feels different. Yeah. Does. And uh, so right. I think it's exactly what you said. It's the intent. It's the intent. That's right. It's, exactly. And the way you communicate, communicate that. that. Communicate it. And then also, and that's why that whole let it go trust is so hard. Because yeah. what we know as designers is we have set forth the intention, but we also know that literally numbers on paper work one way, but the room, the way it actually feels when you pop that up in 3D totally. is totally different, right? It looks like it makes, like the space plan, yeah, there's enough room right. around the sofa. Right. But when you get in the room, you're like, oh, it's a little tight. It just right. feels it's different, yeah. right? And so because we're managing the entire process, we know that we're gonna problem solve. So we know we measure twice, it's gonna fit in the door, it's gonna fit on the wall. It feels a little big, but we also know how to give take, how to massage it, how to nuance it so that when the client walks in for the reveal, we fixed it. Right. And so with the, with the show house, yeah, There's yeah. none of that. It's, <laughs> it's like, like yeah, true. does it work? <laughs> yeah. Does it really work? Um, but I, I think that just the discussion of how renderings can be incorporated and how to properly position them, I think that's the biggest part. For anyone who is a designer who's established, who loves to hand draw, and what, I don't think that you should ever feel like there's not a place for that. I exactly. wish, yeah, I love, yeah. I love yeah. that. I love seeing that, I love watching that. I mean, I can tell you how to do social media on that because I would just watch you draw, yeah. like time lapse. <laughs> well, you know, talking about <laughs> social media, I think it's really important to bring this up for the manufacturers as a sponsor of the show house, mm -hmm. um, and also as a designer in, in, a, in a digital show house because I always talk about this, but it's even more pronounced when you're doing a digital, a digital show house. It's not just what you do. Mm -hmm. It's what you do with it. Yeah. And when you have a digital show house, mm -hmm. the, the, it's interesting. We were just talking about this, right? Some manufacturers really knew how to milk yeah, that and sure. play that, and some just didn't. They just let it lay there. That's a really big missed opportunity. And the same for designers. Yeah. We all supported each other digitally that's right. That's right. on social media. We, we, were like, we more kept pictures. Right, more <laughs> pictures. Let's tag each other. We really knew how to be able to promote the entire that's project. Right. And that's really critical. So I, I, all sponsors out there, manufacturers yeah. who are looking to sponsor digital show houses, even more so, but it's, it's true for regular show houses mm -hmm. too. 
really be collaborative with the designers, the other manufacturers, and, and, and keep tagging each other yeah. and multiply the responses and amplify, amplify is and, the right and word. You, yes. know, you know, Robin, historically that's not really how it's worked in manufacturers. It's always been close or to the chest. Or with designers. Or with designers. Oh but I think designers have taken that leap more so than manufacturers. And manufacturers are realizing that there is value in numbers. Mm. And that opportunity to bring it together. But I think there's one other aspect I'd add to that, which is manufacturers not only participating but truly understanding the leverage of social media and SEO optimization because honestly I think when Leslie and I would sit and do all these calls with these different manufacturers it was really amazing how few really understand SEO yeah. and and the value of yeah. blogs and the value and of the great the videos influencers yeah. 11 designers that all have a following right. Yes. Some got All it, some that. didn't get it. Exactly. Some some got it, but didn't use it. And I want to give a shout out on that note to our host from Diaper Living, who really did get it. Yay, <laughs> Diaper Living, I mean, thank you. I want to say to everyone watching, all manufacturers watching, you know, Jaipur contacted all the designers. Yeah. They featured the designers on their blog. They did interviews with their with the designers. Uh, they did IGTV lives with the designers. I mean, they were on top of it. So if you ever are a brand watching and you want to know how to do it right, go talk to Jaipur Living because they understand how to do it right. And, I, and, I, and this is the case in point. You know, here we are seven months after the uh, show house went live and we're sitting here doing a video that's playing at Fall High Point Market. So, you know, we're, you know, able to remarket the content really and the opportunity for everyone that was involved. So now I want to take this conversation out a little bit further to the real future of design. And I want to talk about that a little bit myself, and then I'd love for you all to chime in. I don't know how many of you that are watching know anything about this, but let me give you a little background. So back in 2007, I actually did the first uh, product development experiment ever done in the virtual world, which is a virtual world of second life. I did this in partnership with Sly Furniture, and I wrote about it for Furniture Today. I used to write the retail ideas column for nine years, and you can still go online and find that column. So Rob Sly, I have to give a credit, uh, if Rob, if you're listening, was the first manufacturer to ever really understand anything about the virtual world. And we set up avatars in Second Life, people that we didn't know, and his daughter, who was 17 years old, had done a, a product collection, and he really wanted to find out if it had legs. So I found someone who owned a seminar room in Second Life, and, hi and he hired, we hired this person, and he ran an entire product development experiment in the virtual world of Second Life. So this was back in Can you just tell us what Second Life is? I don't oh. know if everybody understands what Second Life Second is. Second Life is a virtual world where people, you go on to Second Life and you create an avatar, and you interact with other avatars from all over the world in a virtual world. It is an amazing, so like amazing Sims. experience. Yeah, if probably you've like never Sims. Done it. Okay. I don't know if she knows Sims because I don't. But is that like Sims? A ch children's. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah okay. So today, though, there's something new out there called Decentraland. So I know this might be new for all of you, called Decentraland. Okay. New for me. Have you heard of it yet? No. Anyone here? No, no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. Okay. So this is the future of design, my friends that are listening and everyone around this table. So people, very, very, very uh, experienced people are buying property uh, in Decentraland. So it's a virtual world that's being developed. But what's really important is they're buying property and they're developing houses they're developing complete developments. Hospitality. Virtually, completely virtually. Completely, virtually. completely. And people are buying the properties. Yes. The first house that ever sold in the virtual world was designed by a female architect. It's called the Mars House. So if you're watching, go online and look up the Mars House. And, and it sold, it is a virtual house that sold for $500,000. So it's like an NFT kind of a thing? Yes. Yes, Robin, impressive. <laughs> so for those of you that don't know what NFTs are, they're non-fungible tokens yes. that are being, uh, you know, transferred through the blockchain. And that, that we won't get into that conversation today. But watch out, and I'm sure some of you watching have already heard of NFTs. But what the opportunity is, this is really important because two things. One, we all know lately that product getting product mm -hmm. physically has been really difficult. Yeah. 
we don't really know where that challenge is going. You know, our entire industry really doesn't actually know mm -hmm. where the challenge of getting product is going at this point. So that's the truth, right? Right? <laughs> We've got product. Yes. So, yes. so just so you know, see the living has product in stock. But overall, a beautiful product. In yes. Stock, yes. Beautiful. <laughs> so yes, and Jai Port Living has gorgeous rugs, which are surrounding us right now. Um, but that's really so. From a so here's the thing: you as a designer, if you're watching this, you can design furniture, and people are doing it already. Go look at Andre Reisinger, R E I S E N G E R. He has sold his virtual furniture for hundreds of thousands of dollars. What he, am I doing with it my is, life? What am I doing with my guys? Yes. What am I doing with my life? I am serious. This is happening right uh, now. Real? Wait, 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 wait. Yes. Real hundred thousand, like real money or like, like play money? Real like, money. <laughs> real money? Just to make sure I understand. And he's making a fortune. <laughs> and he has a beautiful website. And the furniture that he's designing is virtual, is beautiful. But now let me ask beautiful. you a question. Is he making the money because people are seeing it virtually? And then ordering it for their real for their real life homes, they, or is he making deals because manufacturers are seeing them and now licensing it? How how is he making? How, why are people buying virtual houses and virtual furniture that they're never that they can never sit in? Sit in. Welcome to the metaverse. I know. I understand. I, I, I and I understand what the metaverse is. I I do. I I just. I can't wrap my arms around spending half a million dollars on a house and hundreds of thousands of dollars on furniture. Where are the real clients that are spending <laughs> this money on their real stuff? <laughs> but here's the thing. People are spending real money no, I know. on these. And so this is the opportunity. So as, as crazy as we all may think it sounds, you are like Leslie. Let me tell you something. Seriously, everybody watching. When Twitter, when social media first became a thing. So I've been doing social media before anybody else. I, I've had it since 2007. When Twitter first became a thing, everyone told me I was crazy. I'm serious. I cannot tell you how many times I was okay, told that. Dollars. Like, just, <laughs> they would tell me, I would come here at a high point, shut up about Twitter already. Like, it's nonsense. People are just talking nonsense. And this is before anyone understood what the potential was for consumer business to consumer communication that was free, right? Yeah. Now here we are, right? So when I'm talking about this to you, you might say, this is crazy, right? This is so crazy. Who's ever going to spend that much money for virtual furniture? But it is where they are already today. And so how do designers, in a, in a, in a way that is, um, how do I say, that brings history mm -hmm. to the table without modifying their, their system, mm -hmm. how do we stay in the parade. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have to modify your system. Yeah. So, There's no question. <laughs> well, you can't not. Well, and you the system to, you of creating mm -hmm. and then and and then like my system is now virtual, right? Mm -hmm. So we've added virtual to our system. Mm -hmm. But this the core of meeting with a client, right. designing something, building it right. and then delivering it and creating an experience for them. Yeah. So how do we take this and manage that experience in a virtual world? What you, would be you your big it. advice? You, you, it's different. So it's just I, different. You, ha you have to that pivot. That is a great question because I think what you're telling us, and if we use that analogy of Twitter, people thought you were crazy because they didn't understand the value. That's right. And they didn't understand why they should take away their time from all the things that they're faced with on a daily basis to now learn something new. And what she's speaking to is the fact that we know our value is not that we make pretty rooms. Our value is that we create an experience. That's right. And so we're trying to translate, because see, I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do I take what I actually do of value, which is create that's an experience, system. That's system. and yeah. translate that to the Twitter, metaverse, exactly, NFT stuff. <laughs> That you're talking about. Well, here's, so here's okay, wise one. Yes. Tell us how to do it. Okay. <laughs> so here's the thing. You don't. You, you have to do. You have to make a choice, okay. and you can do both. So if you think, if you're a designer out there and you think, I don't know how much longer I want to do full service luxury design. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's going to be a market for that forever, given the way the world is going. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the product piece is going. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, how else can I make money? Where is a, a genuine, big, huge financial opportunity mm -hmm. 
I can learn to design furniture and sell it, mm -hmm. design virtual furniture and sell it via the blockchain in the metaverse for people who are building hotels in determined land. Okay. And I also think a really important thing is that I really believe that you know we bring who we are to everything we do. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing it more virtual now, you're going to still bring your perspective, your personality, the, the way you think to that to, to the virtual business that you're creating or the experience that you're creating. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important to, to really uh, understand. But Robin, you know, when you, think, when you think of really what we went through in the last year while we were creating the show house, we did this all virtually. We didn't all get together for a weekend and mm -hmm. figure it out. No. It was Zoom calls endlessly, right? <laughs> and yeah. uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> and it was Zoom calls and a lot of collaboration. And so when I think of what you just said there, I know what a purist you are and, mm -hmm. and how much you like to really engage in a face-to-face. -face. This, this mm -hmm. is you, mm -hmm. really. And so that wasn't you. That was having to figure out a new way to work. Yeah, and right. nobody really thought that Zoom and show houses would take off. And look what happened. Mm -hmm. COVID That's came right. along and changed us yeah. so quickly. That's okay. right. And look at the buying habits. Buying habits have just, I mean, anybody who doesn't believe today in the buying habits, they've shifted That's dramatically. Right. And, you know, I, I know for myself before COVID, there's no way I could have done anything virtually because it's all hands on. Yeah. I need my staff there. Yeah. You know, we, we need to communicate and collaborate. But now, because we're all used to something different and we're used to doing Zoom and doing virtual, I have staff that are virtual, yeah. uh, only virtual with me. I could oh. never have done that. And it's very successful. Oh, and more productive. I have found saved so much time with clients, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. doing Zoom check-ins. Mm -hmm being able to allow them to feel communicated with right. without the travel time. And in Los Angeles, as we all can imagine, oh. you know, you don't just That's go right. out for a quick meeting, you know, it's half a day. And so the time productivity and the adaption, ad the adaptation to this new environment has been a great blessing. Yeah. I've completely enjoyed it. And I'm like, I, I'm into this. And, and, I th and I think it's also really important for all of us because, you know, we're, we're, everyone at the table has been around the block several times yeah. and been in business a long time. Yeah. And it's very, it, it's not so easy for us to change the way we're thinking and change the way we're doing. Yeah. And I think it's really important to stay open yeah. and to have your finger on the pulse of technology, business, and the environment that we're living in. Yeah. Be relevant. And be relevant. Yeah. That takes it takes work. It does. A lot it of does. work. It takes and a lot training, of work. Consistency. Retraining. Retraining. Yeah. Retraining. And, you know, I think you just look, I mean, Laura and I had the same conversation yesterday, you're just talking about parents and, and age. And, you know, your parents lived rich, full lives or professionals. And then now they're struggling with the technology. Imagine how fast the technology is changing now, just mm -hmm. having this discussion right. here about the metaverse mm -hmm. and what that's doing even for us today. Mm -hmm. You know, I look in Jenna's team at eDesign Tribe and I think it's incredible how many people she has oh, creating right. these rendering designs. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is just like a single stepping stone in the pond mm -hmm. to yeah. this metaverse. It is. It really is. It's, uh, it is definitely something new. I know it probably shocked a lot of you to think, oh my God, virtual <laughs> yeah. products, that's not what our industry is about. But if our industry, sh as, as our industry does shift and change, and here's what's really going to happen, you know, and I mean, as you know, more people are born on the earth, they need places to live, right? Mm -hmm. So we already have seen that housing is shifting smaller, not generally larger, right? And shared. And shared. And there's a lot of co-sharing going on. There's a lot of people that need housing that don't have it. We all know that that's an issue in our industry as well. So as dwelling units homes, dwelling units, listen to me already, dwelling units become smaller. <laughs> <laughs> and But we're seeing that. The tiny home movement right. is huge. Yeah. I mean, it's huge. Whether we're dealing with that at the luxury end or not is another, you know, you're not joining the luxury end, but it is a huge market, worldwide market. Right. So we're not just talking about the U.S. This is a worldwide market where people are living in smaller and smaller homes. And so the metaverse, here's the thing, 
it, AR and VR and putting on Oculus, that allows you, as someone that's living in a small space, to create beautiful and see beautiful space around you and to have a feeling that you're living in a much more expanded universe. Yeah. And so as people, you know, they need that, right? If they're living in a much smaller space, you want to have that sense of expansiveness. So if you're able to create that in your own home through augmented reality and virtual reality, it makes sense that if your home is set up in, in the metaverse, that you want to furnish it. And when you have an avatar, you want to dress it. So fashion is already very, very invested in, in, in the metaverse and people are making a lot of money uh, in virtual fashion. So they're in furniture is starting to make money, just virtual furniture. So imagine that possibility if you have an idea. But here's the thing about the gentleman, to your point earlier, he started out designing just virtual furniture and selling it. And then companies did see it. And a few companies have actually licensed him. So yeah, this could be just the other opportunity for all of you watching. This could be a way for you to make money, position yourself at the very forefront of what's going on in the industry, and then later get a licensing deal with the manufacturer who wants to position themselves at the forefront of the industry. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking for like what's new and what's next and what the future of design is going to be, this is where things are so, truly heading. I have a question. You yeah. bet. So the metaverse, as you're describing it, and building hotels and building homes and having furniture, isn't it a little bit like the Matrix? It is. It <laughs> is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it is. you will be lying there in a pod yes. and living completely in this <laughs> metaverse. Yes. <laughs> Eating bonbons. Eating bonbons while we do it. Think about video gaming. A lot of you watching this are totally into video gaming, right? Mm -hmm. So the game, this is just like taking the gaming industry a yeah. step further yeah. and just building it out into our homes. Because you're already doing that in gaming. Yes, you know, my you son's are. a gamer yeah. and, you know, he's building things and buying right, things and right. creating things and right. worlds and yeah. houses. and I don't even know yeah. what. But yeah. so it's, it's really the same. That's it's where it's exactly really coming from. It's exactly the same from. thing. You're just doing fashion in home. So do you think this will also impact, say, the architectural and the building trade? So, for example, would we see instead of rooms, defined rooms, uh, rooms with walls that move more oh, to allow cool. faci facilitate yeah. this kind of option. But we're seeing that in real life too, movable walls, right. rooms that convert, Flex. we're seeing mm -hmm. that, you know. But so as if you, take, if you take technologies like Alexa, mm -hmm. for example, smart homes, and you think of how that's connected, you can see that convergence between the likes of the Alexas of this world and physical objects and the metaverse. And that's, I think, a really yeah. fascinating area. It is, it is. And all of this allows, you know, what we like too. I mean, we all like personalization, mm -hmm. but that obviously is what, you know, younger generations and all of us around this table really love. I mean, you all love for things to be personalized to exactly what you want. And you'd like to change your identity when you feel like it. Mm -hmm. And so creating avatars in the metaverse and dressing your avatar in a different way, just trying out different body types and then trying out different homes, trying out but, different environments. All right, so I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. Yeah. You know, and it is like the Matrix to me. Um, <laughs> it just is, and I love that, I love that, that, that series. Um, the more time that you spend creating this virtual world for yourself means the less time you have for true interaction and true human connection. So is it the whole future? Is it a positive thing for us? Is it, I mean, I, I, I'm throwing it out well, to everybody that, because- Okay, now I, that's I, deep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But what I will say is I, I think that the interaction is different. So if you think about movies like Ready Player One, Mm -hmm. um, you think about like my daughter, like your son, she's into Roblox where she's building houses mm -hmm. and right. she's buying, I don't think about it, I'm like, I'm paying for furniture right now. Yeah, she's right. buying things right. to build her houses. Yeah, yeah. But she has, she has design parties with her friends. They literally are on the phone where That's they can right. hear each other. And she's That's like, right. let's do a tour of my house. Let's do a tour of your house. And so I think the interaction is different because you're interacting in the Metaverse. See, yeah, but, yeah. but that's, a, that's a really good point because 
all the, a lot, most of the games, or a lot of the games now, are multiplayer games. Right. Right. And they are truly communicating yeah. in real time yeah. while they're playing That's together. Right. And that, but and that, they can see each other. Right. And, I mean, it's, it's right. just But different. then they're going to be, really, it's the Matrix, I'm telling you. <laughs> we're lying there in a pod, <laughs> and we're experiencing all of our friends, our entire life, yeah. Everything the yeah. way we want it, well, except an, we're with, lying in a pod yeah. and it's happening. With an in exception, the, in Robin. The exception is touch. Yeah. And that's one thing I think again with the show house, mm. that you know that feel of beautiful velvet or mm. a fabulous mm. suede texture, mm. you don't have that. That's you true. don't have that. You know, that's true. and that and that's to me we're is at you know, <laughs> and and we you know haven't really progressed scratch and sniff to a whole new level, <laughs> but touch <laughs> and smell. <laughs> Uh, literally the big next barriers to this and, and that is absolutely a part of what we intuitively do with our spaces they're for five senses like when yeah, we design yeah, a space right. we're literally thinking about what you can see what you can touch what you can smell it's that's why we burn candles you know it's the whole it, we put cookies out because we want you to, to taste something so all five senses are engaged in the real spaces and so the challenge will be how to how to keep that experience in this virtual and I think it makes it more believable yes. when you have what you've been doing for years engaging all those senses yes. you know that works That's right. and when you only miss you have sight but you don't have touch and but you will you will I promise you that the metaverse as it develops will have that and I just want to say because I said you have to have an open mind and and really be in touch with everything that's happening mm -hmm. in the well what I'm saying here about the matrix and, and, and the things I'm, I'm yeah. that's because I'm not being flexible. I can't yet oh. open my mind to what I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that is a perfect example of that. That's where we have to try to push ourselves yeah. to have, be able to see things differently than we see them now. Because yeah. they will be seen differently in the future and, and not so far off. And mm -hmm. that is... A wrap. No, that is the future of <laughs> that is the future of design, and I want to say thank you so much for all of you, uh, to all of you for being here. I also want to say thank you very much to Kelly Schellert, the founder of Ethos Design Collective, who arranged this conversation, and thank you so much to Jaipur Living for filming it. And I hope all of you that are going to be watching this on Jaipur Living's IGTV feed will comment and share and let us know what you think. We'd yeah. love to hear your opinion. It is a conversation. Yes. yes. Thank you guys Definitely. for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.